Welcome to Property Law 101. My name is Sarah Bronin, and I created this series to help you understand the basics of property law. This series covers four fundamental questions about property and property law. Today, we are talking about the first question, the nature of property. When you think about property, probably the first thing that comes to mind is real estate, what we call real property, uh, property in land. You might also think about uh, personal property, things that you might own, things like a computer or a phone or your bicycle. You know intuitively that you have ownership rights over those things and those things are in fact property. The law also recognizes those things as your property. It protects you from theft of property, uh, whether it's the, the, the computer or even uh, land. Today though, we're covering uh, a type of property that many of us want, uh, don't, don't know how to reckon with. Um, and that is uh, a different category of property that we don't recognize today and that is property in people. It wasn't just uh, a, a, a viewpoint uh, or a, a, a small thing, a small number of people that viewed uh, uh, people as property. It was actually a viewpoint that was enshrined in law. So the law supported slavery. The law enshrined economic profits for slave owners. It was the law that created property rights in people. So in some respects, the law uh, of the land uh, in the 19th century, where we're gonna focus our discussion today, uh, had evolved uh, in the early 19th century to include a couple of prohibitions on the slave trade. In 1808, for example, Congress banned the importation of slaves into the United States. They made it illegal, uh, but this law was only lightly enforced. In 1820, Congress also made it an act of piracy to uh, import slaves, attempting perhaps to reinforce the uh, ban in the 1808 law. Uh, but again, this did very little to curb the slave trade as it already existed in the United States uh, and would for decades to come. But I mentioned these two statues to provide you with some context uh, for discussing a couple of cases today. Uh, in 1925, our first case, uh, the Supreme Court considered uh, a case called the Antelope. It dealt with a slave ship named the Antelope, uh, which held 280 Africans, some of them allegedly belonging to the King of Spain, some allegedly belonging to the King of Portugal. By the time we get to court, there are multiple competing claims on the ship and its contents, including the enslaved persons. One of those claims was from the US District Attorney who filed an action uh, in light of the two statutes that I mentioned, asserting that the Africans on the ship were free. So which is it, free or slave? And what kind of law are we basing our decision on? Well, Chief Justice Marshall writes the opinion in the Supreme Court decision. So we should look at his words. He says, however abhorrent this traffic may be to a mind whose original feelings are not blunted by familiarity with the practice, it has been sanctioned in modern times by the laws of all nations who possess distant colonies, each of whom has engaged in it as a common commercial business, which no other could rightfully interrupt. So what is he saying about uh, the slave trade here? What he's saying, it sounds to me, is that sure, slavery is probably bad, but the law requires us to recognize the rights of sovereign nations in the slave trade because their laws allow it, and so do ours, Marshall says, we have to recognize uh, their rights. So he recounts a number of legal precedents he talks extensively about the sovereignty of foreign governments. And as he did in the Johnson versus McIntosh decision, which we will consider in another part of this series, Chief Justice Marshall talks about positive law. So what is positive law? 
it is the law that exists. It is laws that have been made under proper authority. In the end, using positive law as uh, his, uh, his rationale, he gives 93 of the enslaved persons back to Spain. He does, however, say that the rest are American citizens because Portugal did not prove its claim and they uh, are freed. Another decision uh, in, in the same era was the 1841 Amistad decision, another Supreme Court case, another case involving a ship filled with, uh, in that situation, 53 Africans. Now on the Amistad, it, the facts showed that the Africans were actually kidnapped uh, by their captors. So uh, what happened, uh, the facts of the case were that the uh, 53 Africans on the ship rose up, overpowered their captors, uh, and uh, then uh, landed on the Connecticut coast. This case ensued, and there were a number of claims, including those uh, who claimed that they uh, owned the slaves. Uh, uh, there were those who, uh, there was also, uh, uh, sorry, owned the, ki the kidnapped persons. Um, there was also someone really important representing the adapt uh, Africans in court, and that was President John Quincy Adams. He gave an a, apparently very eloquent uh, eight-hour speech uh, about the rights of these uh, persons uh, and the, the wrongs that they had suffered because of their kidnapping, imprisonment, and uh, exportation to the United States. So the Supreme Court listened to all of the arguments and ultimately decided to release uh, those individuals who were on the Amistad. Um, it, an opinion by Just Story, uh, the court essentially said that since they were kidnapped, they could not uh, it be considered property. They were not enslaved. They weren't. They weren't. They weren't property. They weren't owned by anybody. The court says. It was the ultimate right of all human beings in extreme cases to resist oppression and to apply force against ruinous injustice. So their resistance of oppression and, and their right to do so was recognized by the court. You might know the aftermath of this case. Uh, after they were released, only 35 survived. Many died in prison or at sea. The Amistad case aside, uh, most judicial decisions, again, the law as it was enacted and applied for decades supported the rights of slave owners against black people and even against black persons who were not slaves. The infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857, of course, rejected the notion of citizenship for black people and helped to bring about the Civil War. By 1860, at the dawn of the war, there were nearly 4 million enslaved people in the United States. They were, until the end of the war, property under the law, and they were treated as such for many years after. We uh, should recognize that we're pretty fortunate as a society that the law no longer reduces people to ownership. It no longer wrongly protects slave owners and slave owning. But we must also consider how the people who write our laws today continue to use them to oppress, discriminate, belittle, and treat the other as somehow less human. It's a history we uh, have to reckon with in the United States if we're ever going to make progress, whether in property law or beyond. So with that, I will leave it there. I look forward to hearing from you either through Twitter uh, or through my website where you can sign up to my mailing list and we'll see you next time. Thank you.